Hello, good morning. Uh, you are joining the ICER webinar on Fezzolinitant for vasomotor symptoms associated with menopause. We will be beginning the meeting in approximately one to two minutes. Welcome everyone. My uh, name is Reem Mustafa. I'm the chair of the Midwest uh, Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council, short Midwest CPAC. And uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you to the Fezilinitat for moderate to severe vasomotor symptom associated with menopause meeting today. Uh, I am a professor of uh, medicine and public health at the University of Kansas Medical Center, and I direct the outcome and implementation research there. And uh, between me and, and Steve, we will be chairing different sections of this meeting. Um, to start, I would um, call individuals of uh, the CPAC members to introduce themselves and declare any potential conflict of interest. Um, we want to ensure that all speakers disclose any financial relations with industry. Uh, every member of our CPAC panel who is present today has met the ICER conflict of interest policy, and uh, I'm going to ask all of them to uh, confirm uh, that and that there are no changes to their declaration. I'm going to start that I have no conflicts associated to this topic. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Alan Alt. Hi, good afternoon. I uh, have no conflicts uh, to report and no updates. Thank you. And I'm the CEO of the Patient Advocate Foundation. Great. Welcome, Alan. Um, Dr. Bradley Martin. Hello, I'm Brad Martin. I'm a professor in the Division of Pharmaceutical Evaluation and Policy at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I have no additional conflicts to report. Great. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Bijan Bora. Hi, good morning. Hi, I'm Bison Bor. I am a professor of health services research at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. And I have no conflict. Well, I, I have a conflict of interest, but not related to this. Uh, and that has been reported. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Dr. Don Casey. Morning, I'm Don Casey. I'm a associate professor of internal medicine at Rush Medical College in Chicago and also affiliate faculty of Jefferson College of Population Health and University of Minnesota Institute for Healthcare Informatics. I have no relevant conflicts of interest or relationships with industry. Thank you, Don. Dr. Gregory Kerfman. Uh, good morning. I'm Greg Kerfman. I'm the interim executive editor of JAMA, and I have no other conflicts of interest. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Engve Falkjader. Yeah, hi, I'm Engve Falkjader. I'm a professor here at Case Western Reserve University and Chief of GI and Hepatology at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kurt Vandenbosch. Good morning. I'm Kurt Vandenbosch. I'm a pharmacist with the St. Luke's Health System in Idaho, and no changes to my conflicts of interest. Great. Um, Dr. Albert Huang. Good morning. Uh, I'm a professor of medicine and public health sciences at the University of Chicago, and I have no um, relevant conflicts of interest. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Tim Will. Hi, thanks. Um, Timothy Will, professor of medicine and public health at University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, VA. I have no conflicts um, because I will not be able to be on for the full meeting. I will not be a voting member today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jill Johnson. Good morning. Um, I'm Jill Johnson. I'm a professor at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Pharmacy. I'm a pharmacist. I have no conflict of conflicts of interest. Welcome. 
And uh, last but not least, Dr. Stuart Winston. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Stuart Winston. I'm a cardiologist and uh, working in the patient experience realm as a patient experience consultant uh, at Trinity Health IHA uh, Medical Group in Arbor, Michigan, and I have no conflicts of interest. Great. And now we would like to um, introduce uh, individuals from the patient and clinical experts uh, to introduce uh, themselves. Um, Dr. Stephanie Fabian. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Stephanie Fabian. I am um, professor and chair of the Department of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and medical director of the North American Menopause Society. And I have no other conflicts. Great. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Deb Grady. I am uh, <clears throat> Deborah Grady. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of California in San Francisco. I'm former uh, director of the uh, Women's Clinic at the San Francisco VA and the Women's Health Clinical Research Center and a deputy editor at uh, JAMA Internal Medicine. And I have no conflicts. Great. Uh, Ms. Claire Gill. Good morning, I'm Claire Gill. I'm founder of the National Menopause Foundation. Um, and um, I receive funding from a number of companies uh, listed here and including um, less than 25% from Estellas Pharma. <laughs> Great, welcome. And uh, Ms. Paula Greensmith. Good morning, I'm Paula Greensmith. Um, I am the Chief Training Officer at the Black Women's Health Imperative, and I have no additional conflicts of interest. Great, welcome everybody. I'm going to request that uh, everybody who speaks, including in the policy roundtable, uh, who participate and individuals making public comment that should they announce any financial relations with industry and other potential influences on judgment uh, when they speak. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Steve Pearson, president uh, of ICER, to take us through the next uh, step. Thank you, Reem. Thanks. And good morning, everybody, uh, both the, the CPAC members and those joining us um, online. So uh, we start every uh, meeting by grounding ourselves in the different aspects of why we are here today. And uh, we always start with the perspective from, from the patient. So here's one quote, obviously, I've had meetings where we ask people to raise their hands if they've ever known anybody with the condition that will be discussed that day, wouldn't ever have to do something like that today. Um, but the diversity of the experience is something that's still um, important for everybody to, to understand. Here's one woman's uh, comment. Uh, the sweating and the abrupt rise in temperature are the most bothersome. You know when a hot flash is coming and you are just on fire. And then you know when it's coming to an end because you get cold. So after you were sitting there and your face is sweaty and gross, but you're freezing, it's extremely frustrating. <clears throat> I'm also gonna comment now that we understand that um, the experience of menopause can come through a variety of different uh, uh, pr processes, I guess you could call it. And we'll be using the word woman, although we understand that uh, there's a broad perspective on different um, individuals who can experience vasomotor symptoms um, of menopause. All right, so other reasons that we're here today, other perspectives, um, are that you know when we recognize that there's unmet need that there's that there are situations in which we can do better for health um, and treatments become approved by the FDA. What happens the day these treatments are approved is often a sense of celebration. It's a celebration of years, usually of clinical research, of investments by pharmaceutical companies, often by the federal government before that, um, and investment of time, energy, risk hopes, et cetera, from patients, their families, and the broader community. So there's a very justifiable sense of celebration that we may have something new to help address the unmet needs and to help people live better lives. At the same time, we all are aware that the day that something's newly approved by the FDA, there are lots of questions that still exist, and they still are questions about the basic evidence. Uh, what are the risks and benefits for specific individuals given the early trial data that we have. 
Um, how do these new treatments fit into the entire landscape of options for people, some of which may be prescription drugs and some of which may be something very different? In this case, supplements, you know, other kinds of approaches. So all of this is part of the questioning that we have to do. And along with that go around are questions about costs and prices. Um, because the day that a new drug is, is approved by the FDA, the company has the power to, to basically set a price. And it will do so with a lot of different considerations, um, and we'll be talking about that later today. But it's important to recognize that the, that the reason that we're here today is in part because of questions around the relative pricing of new innovation. And why we do that is because while we'll talk about you know, individuals with, with menopause, people who are uh, looking for new treatments and, and the desire for innovation, Every time we add something to the healthcare system that costs more, we have an influence on everybody in the healthcare system. And we already have a sense that we are at a point at which you can't just add new costs without it having downsides. And so I just wanna frame this, you know, we can talk about um, you know, systems and affordability in these general terms, but it also comes down to real people. And these were folks who were highlighted in a news article um, within the past year um, and it's not just about drug prices. These are about the effect of healthcare costs on people and their difficulty in affording insurance, not just their individual treatments. So Marcus and Allison Ward there on the left, um, they fell into medical debt with the premature delivery of their, their kids there, um, forcing them to change jobs, move back to live with one of their parents, um, and they're still working their way out of medical debt. Um, Sam and Arianne Buck of Arizona are in the middle there, and um, his job actually is to talk to people on the phone about Medicare Advantage plans and to try to get them signed up for insurance. Um, but between employers, he ran into trouble and ended up in the ER, and he and his wife also ended up in medical debt. Um, and in this article, they were discussing their plans to declare medical bankruptcy. Sherry Ann Foy, the woman on the right, she... Um, uh, had retired and was working on an employee and was kind of dependent upon an employer's health insurance program that had a cap on it and did not cover her highly unexpected, very high costs for abdominal surgery that put her into medical bankruptcy. And we just, th these figures and these individuals are often people who don't make it to public meetings and don't testify before Congress that often, but they're in our neighborhoods and our communities and often they're even not this obvious because this survey that is highlighted or linked below found that by extrapolation of the survey sample, approximately 100 million Americans have some level of medical debt that they're covering on revolving credit cards or still in some ways struggling to pay off. And that of that number, one in sevens, so over 15 million Americans said that they had been turned away from a hospital, an ER, or a doctor's office because of their ongoing medical debt. And we know the influence that this has on people's ability to, um, to do the right thing by their family, by themselves, to go to the ER if they have to, to get good preventive care. It drives up costs in some ways overall, but it also really harms people. And so part of the reason we're here today is because these people are real and our need to consider them as part of our broader thinking is very important. So that while we'll talk about uh, menopause, about the symptoms of menopause, we'll talk about the benefits of, of potential new treatments, and we're gonna keep our focus on learning and talking and doing the right thing for patients here in the middle, we have to remember that around them, around all of us are other people, other patients, other families who are, if you will, part of a system that has to find the right balance between innovation and affordability and value such that we can have the right kind of innovative healthcare system that works for everybody. So we're here today to try to wrestle with that tension sometimes, if you will, but it's really a common goal that we share um, to get to the right place. Now you've heard from, uh, you've been introduced to the members of the Midwest Comparative Effectiveness Public Advisory Council or CPAC, just a few words of background about ICER, which is the convening host for these meetings. For our uh, conflicts, if you will, we keep an updated um, pie chart of our revenue on our website. And as you can see, as of today, heading into next year, 
about 69% of our overall revenue comes from nonprofit foundations that are not affiliated with the healthcare industry. Our primary funder within that set of foundations is the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, but we also receive funding from California Healthcare Foundation, from the Commonwealth Foundation, and several others. We receive relatively small amounts of money from general philanthropy, uh, government contracts, and subscriptions to our online platform where our reports are posted. And we also take around 24% of our revenue overall for a separate series of meetings and products associated with our ICER Policy Leadership Forum and our Policy Summit. So that money, which does come directly from uh, manufacturers and from health plans and provider groups, goes to support that line of activity and does not support the research and the meetings um, that we hold like today. All right, so the report that's the substrate for the discussion today um, began approximately seven, eight months ago. And it starts after we've seen a drug that looks promising and is likely to achieve uh, approval and use in some degree, or at least uh, at the time we project that it will. We start by really backing up and saying, okay, let's talk to patients, to clinical experts, to the manufacturer and others, and really get grounded in what the key questions are. Where, you know, what, what are the things that we don't know we don't know even? And where can we look for better evidence? Can we generate new evidence uh, quickly to help support our efforts, et cetera? So that scoping phase is then followed by an internal uh, ICER staff evidence analysis where we go looking again for all types of evidence, published and unpublished, try to work to make sure that we get the most comprehensive view on value that we can. And part of that work um, almost always includes the development of a new cost effectiveness model. In this case, we worked with um, outside academic uh, faculty at the University of Colorado um, on that effort. The report goes through lots of iterative touch points with patient groups, manufacturer, um, and others. And then we have formal phases of public comment and revision. Um, and towards the tail end, we were uh, uh, grateful to have expert reviewers, including the names you see here, Yoko Allen, Louise Craythorn, Deborah Grady, and Kathy Rexrode. How is the evidence report itself, the report, for those of you who haven't read it, how is it structured uh, to support the type of discussion we want to have around value and the kinds of votes on values that will be coming later? Um, one way to, to see that is as a, is a diagram of our value assessment framework, which to a certain extent culminates in considerations around long-term value for money, but it's made up of a lot of different building blocks. And it's the kinds of things that we think of, okay, there's a new treatment, what can it do for us? How do we capture its value? Well, it could help us live longer, or it could have, and or it could have health benefits of helping us return to better function. It could have fewer side effects. It could improve our quality of life. The third one is to think about, again, we're talking about long-term value for money. And so we do have to talk about the cost, but it's not just the cost of the treatment itself. We look at the very broad picture of the impact of treatment on broader healthcare costs, hospital visits, doctor visits, other treatments, et cetera. And in one element of our modeling, we even often look for outside the healthcare system effects on things like reproductivity at work or the ability to care for others in the family. The last two uh, uh, categories, if you will, of elements that we consider in the report and in the discussion today are things that might be even harder to capture in kind of clinical trial data, but which are still can be very important. And so we sometimes call these potential other benefits or benefits beyond health. And we'll talk about those later in the meeting, but they, um, in a sense, inform our broader thinking around the way that health can influence other aspects of people's abilities to meet their life goals. Um, and then the, the very, actually top box somehow got mislabeled, I'm sorry, in this slide, but it should be contextual considerations. And by that, we frequently mean the kind of ethical or, or kind of moral values that we bring to consideration around treatments or, and whether they affect um, people near the end of life, uh, people with very, very severe um, diseases, diseases that have a very large effect on people's entire life course are also elements of what we'll talk about today. So with that, the uh, brief overview of our agenda is that we'll start with the presentation of the clinical evidence um, and deliberation on that uh, with the CPAC, our patient and clinical experts, move then to the economic information. We'll have public comments and discussion right around 11.40 a.m. Central, followed by a lunch break, uh, 
And then the CPAC uh, will return again with our patient and clinical experts for further discussion and specific votes on clinical effectiveness. Um, and we uh, are unlikely to vote on value. I shouldn't say unlikely. We will not, and I'll discuss why, um, linked to our uh, lack of certainty around the price um, for this new treatment that we're discussing today. Following a break, then, we will come back for a policy roundtable where our patient experts and clinical experts will be joined by a representative from the manufacturer community and by uh, people with perspectives from the payer community so that we can really kind of reflect forward and talk about some of the policy aspects of how this treatment that we'll talk about, Vezolinitant, uh, could be covered by insurance. What are the different parameters of insurance coverage, including how much would be asked for out of pocket, but also whether other treatments would be required, et cetera. We'll talk about all elements of shared decision-making and the importance of it. Uh, uh, and in some ways, treatments for menopause is a prime example of where shared decision-making should be everybody's uh, objective. We'll have um, final reflections um, and policy thoughts from our members of the roundtable and from the Midwest CPAC members themselves and we will adjourn by 4 p.m. Central later today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Reem to continue to chair this meeting. And we'll start with, as I mentioned, a presentation of the clinical evidence from Dr. Francesca Bodwin. Reem? Thank you, Steve. Uh, Francesca, we're all ears to hear your presentation. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Francesca Bodwin. I am a senior medical advisor with the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. Next slide, please. I'm going to walk us through the clinical evidence portion um, of today's evidence on fezolinotant, but my key collaborators I'd like to acknowledge were Abigail Wright, Serena Heron-Smith, and Shaharia Mohammed fahim We have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide, please. So we know we're talking about menopause, but briefly, um, this is the permanent cessation of menstrual periods. This is typically defined retrospectively after 12 months of amenorrhea. And we're talking about a low estrogen state. The median age of onset is 51.4, but this acknowledges that the duration of symptoms is actually quite long with a mean duration of nine to 10 years. The timing and duration are affected by many factors, including things like sociodemographics, BMI, parity, um, and the majority of women experience vasomotor symptoms, um, more than 80%. Again, here I asterisked women to acknowledge that even though we will use the term women throughout this report, um, we know that some individuals who experience menopause do not identify as being a woman. Next slide, please. In terms of vasomotor symptoms, this is sort of the hallmark of menopause. We're talking about hot flashes and night sweats. This has been linked to thermoregulatory dysfunction and a lower threshold to eliminate heat. This is thought to be mediated by a low estrogen state leading to inappropriate vasodilation and perspiration. Um, about 40% of women experiencing menopause have moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms. And um, this interferes on occasion with daily life activities, things like sleep, working, um, interactions with partner, sexual activity, and this is defined most commonly as seven or more episodes per day of, of moderate to severe BMS. Um, but this, um, this varies, and we know that there's some also some variation in duration and severity by race and ethnicity with Black women experiencing the highest burden of vasomotor symptoms. Next slide, please. In terms of standard of care, many women, and in fact, the majority, don't seek medical care and often self-manage symptoms with behavioral changes. This is These are things like wearing layered clothing, changing the ambient temperature in a room, perhaps trying herbal supplements. We do know that symptoms resolve over time, but this is gradual, again, referencing back to the duration of symptoms on average between nine to 10 years. Uh, first line pharmacologic therapy, therapy for many is menopausal hormone treatment. Um, and this is often a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Um, this can come in various preparations or estrogen alone. But we know that many women cannot or will not take MHT due to the risk of adverse events, um, which I will talk about a little bit further. But these are things like thromboembolic complications. There are non-hormonal options currently available. Um, these are thought by many clinicians to be second-line treatments. These are things like antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, 
Um, paroxetine is currently FDA approved for the treatment of menopausal symptoms. Um, gabapentinoids, uh, this is gabapentin, pregabalin, um, have been shown to have modest and varying effectiveness for, for VMS. We're not going to talk further about these non-hormonal options today because of the heterogeneity of their trials and modest effects. There is some supplemental information in our main report that's online as well as in today's evidence packet, but we'll leave those non-hormonal options uh, here at this moment in time. Next slide, please. We did speak with um, patients and advocacy groups about the impact of menopause. And what we heard time and time again uh, was that VMS and other symptoms of menopause um, besides VMS have significant negative impacts on day-to-day -day life, sleep, work, interaction, sexual activity. Uh, we also heard um, by more than one patient that symptoms of menopause are frequently dismissed by healthcare providers, and this can lead to symptoms going unaddressed. And there was a strong desire to have more options for treatment and to engage in shared decision-making and specifically non-hormonal treatment options. We also heard about um, concerns about health equity and access to available treatment options. Next slide, please. Today, we're talking about a new non-hormonal treatment option, fezolinotant. Fezolinotant is a neurokinin-3 receptor antagonist. This is thought to modulate neuronal activity in the hypothalamus. So again, talking about thermoregulatory dysfunction and it's an oral once daily medication. It's currently under review by the FDA. It's specifically looking at the 45 milligram dosing. And of note, this would be a first in class medication. There are not other NK3 receptor antagonists currently approved. There are others under investigation, but if this were to be approved, it would be the first in its class. So this systematic review focused on fesolinotant or MHT menopausal hormonal therapy versus placebo for women with moderate to severe BMS. And when data was available, we also tried to compare those to each other. Next slide, please. We were interested in some key outcomes. Um, here are the three that we focused on, but we also explored uh, where data was available, other outcomes such as sleep, um, severity, Severity in the literature is graded in different ways. This was the most common nomenclature that we found, this categorical system of mild to moderate to severe. The distinguishing feature between mild and moderate is the presence of sweating, so sensation of heat with or without sweating. And then to distinguish moderate from severe is whether or not someone is able to continue their activities. So sensation of heat with sweating and um, can or cannot continue activities. So moderate to severe frequency is referring to the number of moderate to severe episodes, either reported on a daily or weekly basis. And then we also examined quality of life as reported via the menopause specific quality of life questionnaire or MenQual, a 29 item tool covering four domains of menopause symptoms, vasomotor, psychosocial, physical, and sexual domains. Next slide, please. And on to clinical evidence. Next slide. So this slide is a little busy, but I'll walk you through it. This is a summary of the five key trials of fesolinotant. Um, the focus of the presentation today will be on the 45 milligram arms of the Skylight 1 and 2 phase 3 trials. Those are the doses that are bolded there for you um, and examining their clinical effectiveness. But before moving on, I'd like to make a couple of other points on this slide. Um, data from these trials came from scientific presentations, abstracts, press releases, and data made available by the manufacturer. There are um, still to date not yet published peer-reviewed literature um, on these data sources, but we did have access, again, to other data from other available sources. Um, the Moonlight trials, are, again, are not the focus of this presentation, but I um, do want to make a notation about them. The Moonlight trials were conducted in Asia, as opposed to the more global population of the Skylight trials that also recruited in the U.S. Um, and there were discrepant results between the 30 milligram Moonlight trials and the 30 gram, milligram arms of the Skylight trials. Um, the 30 milligram moonlight trial had a null result and did not show any difference pl from placebo. But in the skylight trials, there was demonstrated statistical significance between 30 milligram dosing and placebo. And so 
I mentioned this because this highlights potential subgroup differences in treatment effect, as well as perhaps some uncertainty around the point estimates of overall treatment effect, even though the 30 milligram dose is not what we're considering um, for our, you know, the, the, the key, um, key takeaways for this report. And it is also not under consideration by the FDA, but it is, is worth um, noting, particularly as this is a new class of medication. And then lastly, the Skylight trials were still a predominantly um, white population of women who had were undergoing natural menopause, so had not had a hysterectomy, for instance. And there were many exclusion criteria what might not make the findings of the studies generalized to a broader population, but we'll touch on that later. Next slide, please. So again, focusing on those Skylight one and one and two clinical effectiveness trials, the phase three, looking at 45 milligrams of fezolanotant versus placebo over a 12 week study duration. Um, there were statistically, but not clinically significant differences in VMS frequency in both of the trials. Um, I have listed below the minimum clinically important difference. That's that last line, um, which would be 25 per week or 3.57 per day. And you can see on average that both trials, they were reducing the burden of VMS symptoms by about 2.5 moderate to severe episodes per day. Um, there were, however, a higher proportion of treatment responders in both, um, in when you look at across both trials in the fezolinotant arms as compared to the placebo. And that's um, either at the 50% reduction in frequency threshold or the 75% reduction in frequency. And that was people reporting either moderate improvements or much better um, symptoms in terms of frequency. Next slide, please. Looking at severity um, and looking at the difference between the 45 milligram fezolinotant arms again versus placebo at 12 weeks, uh, there were on average across the two trials, there were both clinical and statistically significant um, differences in severity between fezolinotant versus placebo. Um, this was, uh, if you break it down by, and stratify by the trials themselves, Skylight 2 was clinically and statistically significant. Skylight 1 did not exceed that clinically significant threshold of um, a change of 0 0.225 on that three-point scale. I do want to note that um, Looking at the data in this way, it treats those categories as if they're a continuous variable. And so just something to think about here as we're inter interpreting the data, they are ordinal categorical variables and it going from a mild to moderate might not be the same as going from moderate to severe, um, but uh, overall reductions with the fezolinotan arms compared to placebo. Um, we did not receive any data on the percentage of treatment responders with regards to VMS severity. Next slide, please. Um, more limited data with the MenQual. We had access to uh, uh, pooled data from Skylight 1 and 2 with the MenQual. And again, here, uh, there was statistically significant decrease in MenQual in fezolinotant versus placebo at 12 weeks, but this did not exceed minimum cl clinically important differences, um, which would be a, a greater than or equal to one point change in either the vasomotor domain or the total score. There are some discrepancies in the literature about the minimum clinically important difference, but even if we were conservative um, in defining that, it did not exceed that threshold. Um, we did also find some data regarding sleep, um, and there a higher proportion of women in the fezolinotan arm reported much better or moderately better sleep compared to the placebo group. Next slide, please. In looking at menopausal hormonal therapy versus placebo for vasomotor symptoms, I've condensed it all sort of onto this one slide with, with some key takeaways. We found nine studies um, really 10, um, because one study had two trials nested within it that met our eligibility criteria that examined menopausal hormonal therapy. Um, some key things to note here is that there were some heterogeneity in terms of the dose. Um, some of the trials had a lower dose, 0.5 milligrams of estrogen preparation versus one milligram. There were varied routes of administration and um, also heterogeneity in terms of how the outcomes were assessed. Overall, however, there was a decrease in severity of moderate to severe VMS across the trials. I've displayed the range there just to give you a sense of, of what's happening with these trials. Only one trial did not exceed minimum clinically important difference, and that was a low-dose estradiol 
um, arm that was at that lower end point two. And we observed a similar pattern for um, frequency. All of the trials, except for one, exceeded minimum clinically important differences for VMS um, frequency, moderate to severe, number of moderate to severe episodes again. And the one that was not clinically um, different was a, a study examining transdermal estradiol preparation. Um, also to note here that total MenQual scores on average across the trials did not differ between MHT versus placebo. Um, important to note that in these trials, they also reported outcomes in that um, MHT may be effective in treating other symptoms of menopause, such as vaginal dryness, insomnia, that would not be expected to be addressed with fesalinitan. Next slide, please. We attempted to compare fesalinitan to MHT directly, but as uh, might be expected, there were no head-to-head -head trials and it was difficult to even make indirect comparisons due to differences in trial populations and outcomes assessments. We did find one um, trial of MHT that was similar to the fesalinitan trials. And so if we make an indirect qualitative comparison here, the VMS um, severity score was improved in the MHT trials by about 0.6 to 0.8, a further reduction compared to the fesalinitan arms. But again, this is um, this is an indirect qualitative, if you uh, almost comparison between these, and there are no direct head-to-head -head trials really limiting our ability to make any inference of how these two um, drugs would perform against one another. Next slide, please. And um, we've now covered the clinical effectiveness, but also important to take note of, of safety. MHT is a very well studied medication. And because of that, we know that there are serious adverse events that have been associated with the use of MHT and that that risk is different among specific subpopulations. Some things to note are the risk of venous thromboembolism, um, cardiovascular risk that likely increases with age with higher risk in older women, those over the age of 60, um, and also potential risk of breast cancer. Many of these studies, however, are older. Um, some of the data that we looked at was dating back to, you know, to the mid nineties and how might this risk profile change with newer preparations. Um, and there may be some also protective factors of MHT, for example, frac fractures. Fesalinitan, on the other hand is, is quite, uh, new from, but from everything that has been reported in the clinical trials, there are no that short-term safety is good. I would say that across the clinical trials, the short-term safety and adverse events are similar between MHT and fesalinitant, um, but there is the absence of any long-term safety data with fesalinitant. Um, one thing to note with fesalinitant is that about two to 4% of patients in trials experience liver enzyme abnormalities that were all transient and resolved upon cessation of the study drug. Um, headache would then be one of the more common adverse events. And there are some others noted listed, listed below. Um, but again, no long-term safety data with fesalinitant. Next slide, please. To highlight again, some controversies and uncertainties, I've mentioned a couple, but um, whether or not study and trial findings generalize to other populations, um, potentially more diverse populations by race and ethnicity, um, women who might not have experienced natural menopause, for instance, who have had um, a hysterectomy or premature, um, premature ovarian insufficiency, there is again, heterogeneity of outcomes assessments across the trials. And so it makes it difficult to, to you know, compare. We're not comparing apples to apples. And, and so there's a need to standardize some of that. And I think our clinical experts could talk further about that. And then again, just to underscore that we don't know long-term efficacy and safety of fesalinitant. We know the duration of menopausal symptoms is quite long. The duration of the trials is quite short. We're talking about three months, 12 weeks. And um, lastly, uncertainty around safety of MHT in younger women, lower doses. Again, um, what we know is, is from older trials and newer data and MHT is also lacking. Next slide, please. In terms of con contextual consideration, so things to consider as you're weighing the, the clinical and cost effectiveness of these medications, and then also potential other benefits. Um, 
and thinking about the magnitude of the lifetime impact, again, the average duration of VMS is quite long and nearly a decade long and it can affect sleep, work, intimate relationships. Again, the duration of the trial is as short. And so how do we, how do we weigh those findings versus our duration of menopausal symptoms? Um, unpredictable flushing and sweating along with insomnia can adversely affect regular activities and work performance. These things were not captured in the clinical trials. And although there's not caregiver burden in a traditional sense, um, we did hear from patients and advocacy groups that household members or intimate partners may also be affected by um, disruptions related to VMS. Next slide, please. We received a number of public comments. I've highlighted a few here that we have incorporated into our revised report. Um, we heard kind of loud and clear that there should be emphasis on shared medical decision-making as we've incorporated some of that language, but providing women with access to both hormonal and non-hormonal options so that they can make the best treatment decisions for them with their healthcare providers. Um, and again, along the lines of, you know, an unmet need for non-hormonal treatments and the impact these might have on subpopulations who experience higher burden of symptoms such as black women. And then lastly, we heard from the manufacturer that there should be the focus on the 45 milligram dosing rather than 30 milligram dosing arms of the moonlight trials or the skylight trials. And we um, have revised our report to place a heavier emphasis on the 45 milligram trials, but we still feel since this is a first in class medication that we need to examine the entirety of the body of evidence um, and particularly to understand kind of discrepancies between the moonlight trials um, being a null, null trial and a hint of some effectiveness in the skylight trials. Next slide, please. So in sum, um, fezolanotate appears promising at the 45 milligram dosing, particularly for VMS severity, but there's a lack of longer term efficacy and safety data. Um, based on currently available evidence, fezolanotate is likely comparable or inferior to MHT, but again, no head to head data exists here. And in the end, fezolanotate may have a role in the real world setting where many women cannot or will not utilize MHT, but current evidence is still inconclusive. Next slide, please. So in sum, we have, um, you see our evidence rating for fezolanotan um, versus no pharmacologic treatment at all. We have rated as a, a PI um, promising, but inconclusive and fezolanotan versus MHT as an I with insufficient. Um, I think I've kind of summed our rationale for those on the previous slide. So I will end here and um, happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Godwin. This was an excellent overview of uh, what is in the report. Uh, very uh, nicely summarized. I'm uh, keeping an eye for a question and it looks like we have um, two hands up. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Winston. Uh, Francesca, uh, thank you very much. That was a, a clear delivery of, of the data. In the report, there is mentioned on how you develop the minimum clinically important differences, uh, but it might be useful to remind us now and, and the rest of the audience how that came about and what the strengths and weaknesses of the method that you use to come up with the MCID. We essentially extrapolated the MCID from published literature. Um, so we did not generate those ourselves. We were using other sources to determine the MCID thresholds. Um, but this might be actually an interesting place for our us to hear from our clinical experts and how they view those MCID thresholds and their practice. And, um, you know, and perhaps even, um, I know they have some opinions on the men qual. And so this might be a good time to hear about that. I don't know, Dr. Fabian or Dr. Grady, if I can tap on you to talk a little bit about the MCIDs and your practice. How do you view those? Deb, do you want to go first? Sure. I personally think it's very difficult to use an MCID here. Um, one of the bits of information that's missing from your presentation, probably because you couldn't find it, at least I couldn't find it, is what was the baseline number of hot flashes per day among the women who were enrolled in the skylight and moonlight trials? Usually when you use a <clears throat> criterion of having to have seven hot flushes per day to get into the trial, the mean baseline winds up being 12 or 13 hot flashes per day. So if you reduce that by two and a half, have you made that woman's life better? 
you know, I sort of doubt it. On the other hand, when we have enrolled women with much looser criteria, that is the cri a criteria for, would you take a medicine? Would you be willing to take a medicine? Um, are your symptoms, you know, severe enough that you'd be willing to take a medication? And you wind up with women of, with an average of five or six hot flashes per day at baseline, then, you know, a change of three, three and a half is, is really significant. So I find it very difficult to use the MCID in this situation. Uh, and I, I, am distressed that we don't know what the baseline number of hot flashes per day uh, was in those trials. And you're um, right that I think, you know, we were working with the available data that we have and we're lacking some of that baseline data. And so in the end, we thought that the MCID was probably better than relying on statistical significance, but I um, thank I you very that. much for yeah. all of those comments. Really appreciate it. And, and I will say it's reassuring that the severity um, seem to be uh, more significantly decreased than the frequency, which uh, could imply that, that that would be a more important thing. But I, I would agree the men qual is not something we typically use to determine clinical effectiveness uh, when we're treating women. It, it seems to have, if you, if you look at the actual questions, they seem to be sort of all over the place and a little, um, I don't know what the word is even, inappropriate. It's a very old scale and it's commonly used um, but I'm not even sure it's like been validated or, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the, uh, if you look at the items, a lot of them could relate to menopause or might not relate to menopause actually. Right. And then that's another thing to, to, to mention is that menopause is a time, a stressful time in life. Even if a person's not, you know, having vasomotor symptoms, it's often a time when women are feeling like, oh man, I'm getting old. I can't have children anymore. My parents are getting old. I need to take care of them. You know, I've, I've got teenage children. It's so it's, it's often stressful regardless of vasomotor symptoms and, and the men qual seems to mix all this up. Well, thank you. I think this was a great to highlight, um, uh, you know, uh, really potential concerns about some of the tools, but also limitations of the MID. It's the best we have, although has limitations. I see Dr. Kerfman, hands up. Uh, thank you, Reem. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly as a medical journal editor. And uh, whenever I prepare for an ICER meeting, I typically go to the uh, published pivotal trials and spend a lot of time going over them. And of course, uh, in this case, uh, there are no publications, zero. I have reason to believe that at least one uh, was submitted to a medical journal, perhaps more, but has not been published. And that raises alarms for me uh, that uh, perhaps I'm speculating here, I have no inside information, but that at least one or more of these trials has uh, met with concerns uh, in peer review, uh, and we have not seen any publications. To draw any kind of firm conclusions about efficacy uh, without actually seeing a peer-reviewed publication in a peer-reviewed journal, I think is very risky. Um, there are many things uh, about a, a clinical trial that are going to be scrutinized very carefully during peer review. We don't know if that has been done. And we don't really know uh, whether the protocol has been followed. Uh, the statistical analysis plan. We have no way of looking at that kind of information. So I just want to say that from the standpoint of a medical journal editor, uh, I'm unwilling to reach any kind of firm conclusions about this drug. Uh, Dr. Grady is also a medical journal editor. She may want to comment about this, but I'll leave that to her. But I did want to record my deep concerns uh, about tr uh, attempting to draw uh, any kind of serious conclusions about this drug. Uh, I would second everything Greg just said. I was kind of flabbergasted actually that you guys would prepare a report with no published data. Well, 
thanks, uh, Greg and, and, and Deb, for raising these concerns. I think we all uh, share them. Um, Dr. Martin, your hands up. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and I also looked at like clinical trials like that, see if they post the results. Uh, also not there. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask how the rating came to promising and inconclusive. Is it primarily due to the lack of publications? And the, the question I'm asking is related to like our last review um, where we looked at ALS drugs, the MX0035, which was rated C++ in a single trial at 137 for participants randomized to each arm. Um, you know, here we're looking at two trials or three trials that we include the uh, Moonlight trial. Um, is it the lack of transparency that's bringing this down? Um, yeah, I, I would just be curious um, how that, that rating yeah, came. I, I also read the report. There's also some concern about the 30 milligram dose, you know, having, you know, not showing a benefit or, and I know the results were kind of like very obscured on that particular trial as well. I, you know, I think we felt that it was pretty unlikely that this had a large net negative, a negative net health benefit. Um, but we acknowledge that without long-term safety data, that there still might be some. And so that like PI, if you go back, if it's on, um, we have the evidence rating matrix on page four of the, of the handout, just to refresh everybody. And so for us, that uncertainty really came down to the lack of kind of the long-term data. These are short trials. And so even though there was some hint of potential benefit on average promising, if you will, if, especially if you buy the severity data in particular, um, that that the kind of the new drug, long-term safety, and this discrepancy between the you know, the unpublished moonlight trials and the 30 milligram arms of the skylight trials gave us enough pause, but we thought it was unlikely that this was going to have a large, you know, a large net negative benefit, if that makes sense. And so that's sort of where we fell out on the, on the matrix. Um, I can let David, you can chime in further if you have additional thoughts about, about that or on the comment of kind of unpublished data in general. Sure. I, I can comment on both of those if you like. Um, on the issue of promising but inconclusive, that's a very common ICER rating for a new drug of a new class that's expected to be used long-term where we only have short-term data. Um, there's lots of evidence out there that um, a high percentage, like with 25% of drugs get a new black box warning after FDA approval, um, when they're in a new class and haven't come on the market, you know, nothing like it has come on the market before. So we routinely worry about this issue and are unlikely to conclude that we're sure a drug isn't harmful based on short-term efficacy data when long-term hasn't been looked at. On the question of um, doing a review where we have only unpublished data, um, we time our reviews to try to come out around the time where we're expecting FDA approval to occur. Uh, we would much rather have published full data sets, um, but our expectation is that this drug could come on the market and that providers, patients, and everyone else may need information from an ICER report with the data that are available now. Um, and so we do our best to talk about that based on what we've got. We, of course, would like to have more. Can I, David, chime in really quickly as well? Because I heard something about the men call before from, and I'm really interested, Dr. Grady, in your comments. One of the things we did find in the literature that I'm interested in, it's cited in the public comments, is irrespective of treatment, they found authors of this study, I'm happy to, to send it to you, found a really strong correlation or association between VMS severity and frequency and the MenQual. Um, and this is a, on purpose because it's kind of a lead into the cost effectiveness analysis, but I saw your hand up, so I wanted to get your, your thoughts on that. <clears throat> I didn't uh, actually have my hand up for, for that reason. Um, you know, nobody, 
I, I, I don't know. You can ask other people, but I, I just, uh, all of the experts I know include the Menqual in a research study because it's the only thing we have, but nobody really would use it to judge patient improvement uh, or change in quality of life. At least that's that's just my, my perspective. Um, I basically have my hand up to ask a question I don't know the answer to, and that is, do you guys... Do you guys revise these um, ICER um, uh, reviews periodically? Because it seems like you're you're kind of skating on thin ice, so to speak, right now. But given a year or two years or every three, I don't know what would be the appropriate interval. But it seems like they ought to be updated. We have practices for updating our reports under some circumstances. And also, um, there's a tool available called ICER Analytics where people can put new estimates of effect um, into this tool and recalculate our cost effectiveness results as new information comes along. Um, but we do also explicitly sometimes re-report re on an evidence rating if we think that will be helpful to people. Uh, you know, sometimes it's very obvious to people as new evidence comes along where they're falling and going back to a three-year-old report as new evidence comes out may not be helpful to people because they, they, they're well aware of what the new evidence is. But other times we have explicitly put out uh, new ratings where we thought it would be helpful. Thank you, David. And um, Deb, for these important discussions, I see... Um, Claire, you have your hands up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, apologies for how I sound. I have this horrible, thank goodness we're not meeting in person because I would have missed it. But um, yeah, I just, it's interesting to hear from a clinical perspective because as noted in the comments that my clinical team and, uh, and board put forward, you know, again, when the, the data is not available to, do, to judge the effectiveness and then yet this process is happening at this time and I, get all of the, the benefits for doing something as, you know, something comes to market to be able to, you know, uh, review something. But in some instances, you know, as Dr. Grady said, a year from now just seems like it would have been a much better timing for this review. And then if, if this process, if, if this diligent process isn't followed the same way a year from now, you know, when the data is actually available or the data is published, then I think we're doing a disservice to kind of really figuring out what is the effectiveness both for the patient and for the cost effectiveness of these new treatments and values. So I know we've been back and forth about this, you know, but I feel like I'm, uh, I, I keep raising this and then to hear, you know, with many of the other clinical clinicians and scientists saying the same thing, you know, again, I have that, that was my concern and, and being part of the process and wanting to represent the patient. Again, I think when the data came out and would be available a year from now it would be a fantastic, you know, how do we then follow up on that and make sure that we're evaluating what what is then known you know and and quite honestly i'm, I'm looking at this from a perspective of the women's health initiative right look what happened when we made assumptions um based on data and then what we know now you know 20 years later the clinicians are still operating on those old that old science and so that's my concern as we walk through this process no i, I think that's a fair concern um it's just worth remembering that two things one is that um, if we could know that the drug wouldn't be marketed to patients until those data became available, that would be very different. Um, but that is unlikely to be how things occur. But and isn't that what the FDA is supposed to do, right? If the yes, FDA, the FDA, is the FDA it. will decide, but the FDA doesn't have to put the data out. The FDA will say what they think about the data, but they don't have to, you know, unless That's they the hold unless they hold an advisory committee meeting, we may not know more. Um, and the second thing is, remember, we started this review nine months ago, eight months ago. We didn't know that none of the data would get published over that period of time. You know, it's not that these trials hadn't completed at the time we started our review. You might have imagined that over an eight or nine month arc that we would have these data. Great, we're approaching our um, end of the time for this discussion. Um, and maybe I just will end with a question that's uh, raised by Dr. Johnson. Would an, an insufficient be a more appropriate rating rather than PI? Any, any thoughts about that? And then we're gonna move to the next uh, section. 
I would, you know, again, just to highlight, we felt that it was very, very unlikely that Fezzolanotant had a, you know, a large net negative health impact based on available data, the two safety trials, and then um, three other trials. And so it was more, you know, did it have any benefit or what, you know, neutral, or was there a, a slight negative health benefit? We did not feel like it went all the other, other way um, based on the data that we have accessible. But that's, that's a good question. I mean, and something we grappled with ourselves as we, as we rated the evidence that was available. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, thank you for this uh, really excellent discussion. I'm sure some of these points we're going to come back to as we're discussing the voting. So um, maybe more to come, but we would like to uh, give the uh, mic to Dr. Brett McQueen to take us over the analysis and the value part of this meeting. Thank you so much. I know some of you might be hesitant to take this step, but as we walk through this, I would like you to think about the relationships that we're building with the model and how, as um, Dr. Rin mentioned, we can advance that later. Um, we can always add those inputs later. So think of the, the relationships as very important here. Um, so I've already been uh, introduced, Brett McQueen from University of Colorado. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to acknowledge uh, Ashton from ICER, as well as Eric from the University of Colorado. And then uh, I have uh, no financial conflicts to disclose as defined here. Next slide, please. So our objective was to assess the lifetime cost effectiveness of fezzolinotent relative to no medical therapy. And that's estimated by the placebo arm of the fezzolinotent trials. And um, as it was sort of discussed um, earlier, we are looking at the emphasis on women who cannot or will not take menopausal hormone therapy. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So just a brief overview of the methods. Our population are women seeking relief from vasomotor symptoms associated with menopause. And I list the time horizon as lifetime, but that's different than the symptom duration and the duration of treatment, which is approximately 10 years. So it's important to note that uh, that is different than the time horizon of the model. Interventions and comparators. So we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but we really wanted to look at fezzolinotent isolated versus no pharmacologic treatment uh, versus, um, uh, excuse me, versus that placebo arm. And then separately, completely separately, we're looking at menopausal hormone therapy, again, versus the same placebo arm that we would have observed from fezzolinotent. This can help us aid in our understanding of the cost effectiveness at this early time of fezzolinotent. Uh, our outcomes are total and incremental costs, quality adjusted life years, equal value, of life years, symptom-free days, and I'll define what I mean by that, um, actually when we get to the results, and then the incremental cost-effectiveness ratios for those outcomes. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a brief overview of the model schematic. So we have an on-treatment and off-treatment model structure with all-cause death as a possibility. Uh, there's a couple of wrinkles here. It's a very flexible framework because we can include differences in health-related quality of life for women on versus off treatment. We can include upfront discontinuation. So let's say that's a tolerability issue in the first three to nine months or up to a year. And then over time, um, from evidence that is, is really well established on the long run duration, of symptoms. And as those resolve, we see women discontinuing treatment. Uh, and then finally, we can also include cost offsets for treatment versus no treatment. So are you seeking less care with a treatment that, that's controlling uh, those symptoms? Next slide, please. The model characteristics are representative of the Fezzolinotent trial. So about a mean age of 54, a median duration of 9.4. So the model is going to reflect exactly that median uh, annual um, overall for the population, uh, both seeking and not uh, seeking treatment for their duration of VMS. 
And then the baseline, so that we are, already had a discussion about this, this is really the range of mean that we found from the literature of about nine to 12 episodes per 24 hours, which is, is a lot. Um, next slide, please. There are a few key model assumptions uh, to note. You can actually look at the report for the full table, but these we feel like are, are the most important to point out. First, patients not responding to fesolinotin or other active treatments will not be retreated with other treatments. The point here being, we're just trying to isolate the value of fesolinotin used as first line. Um, we're not trying to model, the objective is not to model the entire course of menopause, although that is a very valid objective. It wasn't. Uh, the objective of this analysis. Second, the duration of treatment in the model is consistent with VMS duration. I actually have a figure that I'll show you in a few slides. It's assumed the same for all treatments. So there's no incremental difference between, for example, fesolinotin versus no pharmacologic therapy and separately uh, menopausal hormone therapy versus, versus uh, no pharma pharmacologic treatment. Finally, Finally, the effectiveness of fesolinotin and, and comparators, the health-related quality of life benefit starts immediately. And then if they stop, it stops immediately. So the point is there is no waning over time. There's no residual benefit after stopping therapy um, uh, as there really wasn't any evidence uh, of this effect happening. Next slide, please. So this is the, the duration of VMS and treatment that I was speaking about. This is from the SWAN study that shows you on the, on the uh, y-axis, you're seeing the proportion of women at their very first VMS report. How long over time in terms of the duration are they experiencing symptoms? And then it's actually broken out by stage. And, and so the important point here is that in the model, not all women are on the treatment for the full 10 years. Some women are on the treatment for longer than 10 years, and some are on it shorter than 10 years. It's just reflective of the proportion of women experiencing uh, VMS episodes. So we are using this evidence to come up with our transitions between that on state and the off state that I showed you earlier. Next slide, please. Uh, the costs, at, we've already spoken about this earlier, but the Fesolin intent price is a placeholder price. So we need to interpret these findings with caution. The net annual cost based on uh, uh, what we feel like are reasonable comparisons might be or projected to be 6,000 per year. We have no confirmation of that. Again, it is a placeholder price. The bottom row shows menopausal hormone therapy. Remember I spoke that we're gonna have this sort of scenario analysis that I'll show you towards the end of this presentation. That price shown per year, the 123.45, is the combination of generic estrogen and progesterone um, prescribed uh, as a generic drug. So that's that's kind of that merged price. Next slide, please. So in order for us to calculate quality adjusted life years, equal value of life years, uh, we need some type of uh, health utility score, which estimates, uh, in a sense, at start the burden of the disease on a patient's health-related quality of life, and then any sort of differences or benefits that we see from treatment. And in this case, we started, and I know we just had a discussion about the men qual, but we started with, with probably the best case for us to calculate that utility score, which was a mapping instrument from the men qual to a utility score. And you'll see this estimate is different than um, what Francesca uh, presented earlier. It's minus 0.33, and that's because it's a weighted average of Skylight 1, Skylight 2, uh, as well as some assumptions made moving from 30 milligrams to 45 milligrams in the Moonlight trials. So it's, it's a, a really combination or synthesis of multiple trials. We then map that to the EQ5D, which produces a health utility score. And you'll see on the far right, we're starting at 0.811 as the baseline health-related quality of life. That is fairly consistent with uh, evidence that we've reviewed in the literature. You can see that in the public comments. And then you'll see as you move over, the benefit increases when on menopausal hormone therapy as well as on fesolinotin. Remember, we're comparing fesolinotin to no pharmacologic treatment separately, menopausal hormone therapy, again, to no pharmacologic treatment. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So how does this all work out in terms of the results? Well, 
First, you'll notice on the top row, using that placeholder price of 6,000 per year, we get an intervention cost of about 45,000 versus zero dollars as expected with no pharmacologic treatment. In that sort of middle other non-intervention cost, it might seem like maybe a fairly big number to you. And that's because we're, we're using unrelated health state costs. And this is largely driven by the menopausal hormone therapy scenario analysis. So including um, as Francesca spoke about breast cancer, cardiovascular complications, Really important to note here, there's no incremental difference between fesolinitant and no pharmacologic treatment on those costs, on those unrelated health state costs. The difference in that, incremental difference in that, is actually just a treated versus untreated cost offset that we include. That's the only real difference between those two arms in terms of other non-intervention costs. So when we add all of that up, we get a higher total cost for fesolinitin versus no pharmacologic treatment, but that also comes with a higher benefit, both in terms of quality adjusted life years and equal value of life years, and also the frequency of episodes per day. Remember, we kind of already talked about the 2.5. We use that in the model to then calculate sort of a total time of symptoms that we would expect we could offset. And, and I'll get into that on uh, the next slide, which you can switch to, please. Uh, actually, it was, yes, it is this slide. So for fesolinitant versus no pharmacologic treatment, using the placeholder price of 6,000, we would get a cost per quality gain of about 390,000 and a cost per equal value of life you're gained of the same value. Why is that? Well, there's no life extension in this case. This is all symptom improvement, quality of life benefit. So those end up equaling uh, the same um, for, for those two, two outcomes. And then the cost per symptom free day, I really want to spend a little time on because we're by no means, as Dr. Grady mentioned, we're by no means uh, suggesting that women starting at 10 episodes per day and shown in the trial to avoid 2.5 are all of a sudden going to avoid a full day of VMS. But what if we added up all the different episodes over the course of say a year or the entire transition of menopause, how many episodes would we avoid? And then if we added those up to a day where a day would be about 10 episodes, how much would we have to pay for that for coverage of bezalinitin? And that's about $500. It'll be, I'll show you the scenario of menopausal hormone therapy, and then you can kind of see the difference side by side to also the cost per quality and cost per equal value of life year. Next slide, please. So this is, might look a little bit different to you than what you've seen. We've separated incremental costs and incremental qualities in our one-way sensitivity analyses. And really what we're doing here is just saying, what's driving the numerator and what's driving the denominator? We would expect, let's start at the bottom first, we would expect that health-related quality of life would be a major driver. This is a symptom-based model. It's a treatment that's uh, trying to improve symptoms. It seems pretty obvious that that would be a, a really wide range in what we would produce in terms of our incremental quality. So at the very bottom bar you see on the far left, that's essentially you know, equivalent to zero difference between um, uh, the fesolinitin and no pharmacologic treatment. And then on the other side, that's more of the, the bigger benefit. Um, and then on top in the numerator, we're really looking at cost of treated VMS per year as, as a key driver, not a huge driver, but it's one that, that does matter in the model. And this is just suggesting, what are you already spending on VMS per year? Are there outpatient visits, maybe even ER and inpatient visits? We did find a very small proportion of women with significant um, events going to, to hospitalizations and, and uh, ED visits. Next slide, please. So what I showed you before was really on how do we isolate one input and then see the impact on the output. In this case, based on that placeholder price of 6,000, we're varying a bunch of different inputs in the model. We're recalculating over and over again, thousands of times, and then we're going to take the proportion of those that might meet these commonly cited cost effectiveness thresholds. That ranges from 50 all the way up to 150,000 per quality. So you'll see about 1% meet the 50,000 per quality threshold, 5% the 100,000, 
and then 14% with 150,000. So again, some of that is driven by there are uh, women that showed higher benefits in terms of their health related quality of life. And there are those that showed lower benefits than the mean. That's reflected in this analysis. Next slide, please. So I've spoken already about the scenario analysis, and this is using menopausal hormone therapy at that $123 per year. And then also at the benefit that, that we uh, estimated in that utility um, uh, estimate on, on the previous slide. We see a cost per quality gain of about 13,000. Again, those are equivalent for cost per equal value of life year gained. And then the cost per symptom free day drops from 500 down to the $12. Uh, again, we can't compare the two. This is a totally separate analysis because of our emphasis on uh, women who cannot or will not take menopausal hormone therapy. So I want you to view this as an understanding of where, if we were to use that placeholder price uh, for fezzolinitin, where it sits in terms of its values. So this is just an aid to help you understand that. Next slide, please. Uh, so what price would meet these uh, uh, commonly cited cost effectiveness thresholds? Well, we did that analysis. And again, they're the same for, for qualities and equal value of life years. The range is between about 2000 to 2500 to meet the 100 up to the $150,000 uh, per uh, threshold, either qualities or equal value of life years gained. So that would be a, a value-based price in a sense. Uh, next slide, please. We do have some uh, limitations to note. Um, we, we didn't have, we've already kind of talked about this, but we didn't have any direct comparisons between fesolinitin and MHT given really inconsistency in trial endpoints. But as we spoke about earlier, it's also our emphasis on women who cannot and will not take uh, menopausal hormone therapy. I know we've already spoke today about the mapping uh, between men qual and utility scores. We do understand some of this is a limitation. We might not be capturing sort of nuanced changes in health related quality of life. I will say the, the trial paper that I cited earlier in, in my comment um, really did show a nice association between VMS frequency and severity and the men qual instrument, changes in the men qual instrument. And then we had no evidence on treatment effects for cost offsets. I already showed you that there was a cost offset, so that might be a little confusing. The point here is to state that um, really we only had a claims based, you were treated or you were not treated. So we weren't really able to get at the differences in the treatment effects between say would MHT versus no pharmacologic treatment produce a different cost offset than for example, fesolinitin versus no pharmacologic treatment. So it was just a treated versus untreated difference. Next slide, please. Uh, we received a, a number of comments. Uh, I think there was a little confusion on model structure and uh, you know, a comment that it's, that it's basic. It's basic for a reason because we can actually be quite flexible with how we characterize health related quality of life. I already talked about discontinuation over time in terms of resolution of symptoms. It allows for a lot of flexibility um, in whatever. We didn't, wouldn't have to use MenQual if we didn't, if we had other instruments that we could have used. Uh, the second bullet um, is about treatment switching and discontinuation. I spoke about this earlier, but we really aren't interested. The objective is not to, to understand the whole transition all the treatments that women would take throughout the menopausal transition. It's really to understand the, the value of that first line um, uh, therapy. So, um, and you can review all the other public comments uh, in our responses as well. Next slide, please. So to conclude at the placeholder price, so that's 6,000 per year, the base case findings suggest there is a gain in qualities and, and equal value of life years over no pharmacologic treatment. But again, at that placeholder price, we'd see an increased cost to the health system. Some of the key drivers, I spoke about this at the beginning, I want you to understand the relationships, health-related quality of life, however you define it, however you measure it, it's a big factor here. It's gonna be a driver. Any sort of cost savings is another area that, that might be something we can, uh, uh, the field can work on in terms of future research. 
Uh, and then uh, just a, a close in closing, the cost effectiveness of Fezzolinet really, Fezzolinet really depends upon both its price and then the population using it, which is all women or women who cannot or will not take menopausal hormone therapy. So uh, I believe that is it for me. If you go to the next slide, I'll take any questions. Well, Brad, thank you so much for a really clear presentation and hitting on uh, so many important points and probably things that we're uh, asking in our heads as we were uh, reading uh, the, the report. Um, I, I want to just highlight the, the point you mentioned in the beginning about the importance of such a model to be available and, and maybe connected back to Claire's point earlier um, that having these tools available will make it feasible when more data is, is out there that we can apply it right away and don't have to wait. So all the rigor that went into this is, is definitely going to be useful now and in the future. Uh, I see um, Dr. Grady's hands up. Yeah, I I think it's really important to keep in mind that you know, you read this figure, 80% of women have vasomotor symptoms, but really only maybe, I don't know, 30 or 40% really want to take a medication because their symptoms are bothering them enough. So I'm not sure how you treated that. Secondly, this statistic that vasomotor symptoms last for 10 years, it comes from Swan, where about every six months they asked women, did you have any hot flushes in the past month? Oh, that's, you know, if you... There are other studies where they asked about bothersome hot flashes and the duration of treatment was more like four years. I mean, the duration of symptoms was more like four years. I'm not quite sure how that would affect your model, but I think it's an important difference because it's not a woman having one hot flash in the past month is not going to take either of these medications. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, really important to consider as well as I I assume that you're assuming that fizzolinitant will have a consistent efficacy over 10 years, even though it was studied for 12 weeks. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot there, Dr. Craig. <laughs> so let me start with your first point. Um, we did base the model and the characteristics of the model on women with moderate to severe. So it's that, that threshold, not only of frequency, but also severity. So it's the indicated intention to treat population in the Fesalimitant trials. We also tried to map that over for the separate comparison between MHT and no pharmacologic treatment. So that, I think Francesca spoke about this earlier, trying to sort of compare as best we can apples to apples, um, even though we're sort of, we're, we're sort of merging trial evidence on Fesalimitant. Um, and then to your second point, it's really important to understand that we are not assuming duration differs incrementally. So, to, I totally understand what you mean about the SWAN study. It wouldn't actually impact if we were to lower the duration or we were to increase the duration of treatment, it wouldn't affect the incremental results between the separate analyses. So that's a, it's a really important point that even if we were to decrease the duration, you'd have basically the similar, uh, a similar cost effectiveness analysis uh, estimate. And then that kind of goes to your final question, which is, Yes, we are assuming that 12 weeks would last over longer durations, but we're finding the same cost effectiveness estimate, regardless if we're looking at this in a year or two years or 10 years, they're very similar because there's really no difference in or waning effect that we assume. But to your point, I, th I think that's something that we can build in later if, it, if the evidence uh, is inconsistent with that assumption. Thank you. Um... Brad, I see your hands up. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, two questions. One is just a quick clarification. So just so I make sure I understand. So you incorporated the vasomotor symptom frequency, but that had no had no relationship to the ultimate utility or you know qualities that were generated. That was exclusively to generate the uh, vasomotor symptom free days. Yeah. So when we tracked the frequency of the model, that was the separate cost per okay. symptom free. Yeah. But frequency and severity have been associated with the MenQual, and it is a domain of the MenQual instrument. So, sure. But yes. But you didn't take the trial data and, and try to map that. I just wanted to confirm that. Then the second, um, I was a little, I guess, surprised because when you look at 
an MSHRT, MHD uh, model. Um, you know, you incorporated cardiovascular events, fractures, VTE, um, but in the model results, the you know, life expectancy was identical between the two arms, which is kind of surprising, you know. So was, you know, mortality considered with those or those? Yeah. Because um, I was well, just surprised yeah. that you would land, that model would land on identical uh, life expectancy. It's a good question. You have to go five points out on the decimal to get the, <laughs> to okay. get the difference. And a lot of it with the cost and the difference in survival and quality of life has to do with just averaging and the really ultimately the low baseline, even I'm not, I'm not downplaying or discounting cardiovascular complications or breast cancer, but when you actually look at the incidence and then you're looking at the broader population, you're already starting with a small group that gets each of those complications. And then you're looking at the incremental difference between the treatment and the no pharmacologic treatment, and it, then it becomes MHT versus no pharmacologic treatment. And then it becomes a, a pretty small effect. Now you could do, and there are sensitivity analyses that you should view there in the supplement, which has all the different, um, just for the MHT comparison. And you can see that when you increase or decrease, those are pretty big drivers of the model. So it's just important to know that that's the average, but there are um, uncertainty bands. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Grady, I'm assuming your hand is a legacy hand, but if you have another question, please let me know. Okay. Um, Brett, I, I have a question and, and it may be a, a, an assumption that I'm making and I wanna make sure that it's uh, appropriate. So when I, I look at these results, I, I get the sense that in general, they're on the optimistic side, um, giving the, the assumptions that went into the model. So if I look at these, you know, the choice of moderate to severe, uh, the effects that are a little even more than what we've seen in the uh, clinical effectiveness uh, points and, and so on. Is, is that a fair uh, assumption? And, and maybe I just will state something explicitly. Again, I believe it was mentioned, but um, as women, we have this uh, uh, philosophical issue about history, you know, that historically issues like this have not been um, uh, treated fairly in the sense we were more optimistic about the evidence and a lot of women were harmed by that optimism. Um, so I would love to hear your, your thoughts about, are these a little on the optimistic side as far as um, estimates? Yeah, it's a good question. And also great context. I mean, first of all, I acknowledge I'll never go through this transition, obviously. I think it's important to note that I learned a lot through the process, talking directly with patients, hearing from our clinical experts. And this, I think, is my third women's health review. And every single time it comes up that, you know, symptoms are ignored or, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens for women um, that we need to acknowledge, and, and we did throughout the report. But to answer your question, I don't know if I would say the assumptions are optimistic or pessimistic. They just represent what we felt was, how can we isolate the value of first-line Fesalinitin? And what are the assumptions that we can make that are defensible, that we can go in and say, we're gonna, if women were to stay on this treatment for this duration, and not try to bias towards, you know, menopausal hormone therapy and that separate comparison, meaning the durations are equal, whatever we can do to just say, this is a, a fair comparison. I don't know if I'd call it optimistic. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'd say optimistic, but we, I, you know, we always try to be as fair as possible based on the evidence that we see, so. Thank you, Brett. Uh, I see um, Steve hands up and then David. Uh, look at us. All right. Um, I just want to ask a question thinking forward. We'll talk more about this uh, in the policy roundtable. But I was struck by, by uh, Deborah's comment that for a woman who has five to six hot flashes a day, reducing them you know, by two to three might have a bigger change on their quality of life than someone who's at the 10 to 12 range. And the way the model is structured it, it's a consistent effect on quality of life across whatever spectrum of 
beginning numbers of hot flashes you have, right? I mean, there's no way right now that the model would be able to set up a differential quality of life effect at a lower threshold. Is that right? You could easily build it in if the evidence is there. Um, so that's course. kind of my question. Yeah. So just, just I, and uh, again, I'm not, this, this is not that germane. We're not going to be taking a vote on value given the pricing situation anyway. But just maybe you would comment on like what data would help you as a modeler capture that effect. So yeah, if we were giving right. advice already to the manufacturer or clinical researchers going forward. What kinds of data would you need to be able to capture that potentially differential effect? Yeah, it's it's a fantastic question. And actually, it's quite simple. It, it, let's just go in assuming that we believe the menqual, which I know is a very difficult assumption. But if you go in believing the menqual is associated with both frequency and severity of VMS, and you can show that the difference between having 10 episodes down to like seven and a half, or if you start at five, you would expect down to two, that's absolutely reflected in the mapping instrument, which means all you need is a direct input to the model to, to make that happen. So there's really nothing structurally in the model that prevents that kind of evidence as an input. Um, I think it's hard to find that evidence. <laughs> we, we, look, we did look for the different changes based on, on where you started and the baseline, but it really would require a separate analysis for that subgroup that that are lower but there's nothing structurally preventing that it would be quite easy to do that it's just i, th I find it just it's an interesting situation because usually we think the, of the cost effectiveness usually improving with greater risk or higher level yeah. of severity and i understand why the company might have picked their threshold because they don't want to deal with regression to the mean uh too much if they're starting at a lower level uh, if you would call that regression to the mean maybe it's just natural history but Anyway, it, it, it's a. I can imagine that as an interesting challenge for researchers going forward if they want to, and if the drug is used in patients with lower uh, baseline numbers of hot flashes. Anyway, we'll talk about that in the policy roundtable. Good point. Great, um, David. You're you're next. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Reema, your comment about um, optimistic assumptions. Uh, the the one that I certainly didn't think was optimistic, although it's hard to know for sure, was blending in the moonlight data, assuming that when they announced that they hadn't gotten a statistically significant benefit in moonlight one, that the effect was null. And then to blend that in as a null effect with an absolute difference up for this much better for 45 versus 30 milligrams, um, that may be perfectly fair, and I suppose it could even be optimistic. It could be that when you looked at it, um, they did worse than placebo, but it did, if I had to guess, it wasn't an optimistic assumption there. Thank you, David. Very helpful. Um, Tim. Uh, thanks. I want to get back to the MID comment for just a moment. Dr. Grady raised some good points as did Steve. I think patients would be more interested in doing something at higher severity, but the point being, I think, uh, uh, as Dr. Grady suggests, that if you're at 15 and went to 12, for example, versus, I'm just sort of making it up, five down to two, that's an absolute difference of three, but the relative effect is dramatically different. You've got almost a 50% reduction in that lower group and about, I don't know, 10 to 20. So I think in the modeling, it would be relative versus absolute differences. And that's the same way with MIDs. They often derive an MID based on a threshold patient's note at an average for what the population was, but they rarely look to see if the MID varies by severity because it's essentially some version of a percentage change in their baseline symptom. You'd probably need a bigger change at higher severity points. It's the same percent difference. So uh, I think ideally scale scores and MCIDs should be recalibrated to the severity of the populations that they're looked at. They rarely are. They just kind of say it's four or whatever, and they carry that out regardless of whether you're really mild or really severe, but they are sensitive to that baseline severity. 
it's a really good point. And uh, <clears throat> we see this a lot with instruments that aren't sensitive to those changes and that are really looking at absolute and not relative. And uh, it's a really good, good point you bring up. Great, and I, I just wanna highlight, um, uh, Dr. Lynn mentioned something that the entry criteria in terms of frequency and severity for VMS in the trials were based on the FDA guidance in this area. Um, so again, may not be the best, but the best we have. Um, Dr. Grady. And that was just what I was gonna say is that, you know, the FDA has clear guidance for studies of treatments for menopausal symptoms and they require seven, you know, seven per day or 49 per week. So you wind up with a fairly symptomatic sample, usually with an average of 11, 12, 13 per day. When I've done studies that weren't going to go to the FDA and have just used an entrance criteria, do you have hot flashes and would you like to get treated for them? The mean is way around five or six. So I, I don't know how that affects your model, but I think that the people who will actually, in the end, choose to take fesulinicant, if you know, when it becomes available, won't be limited to those with very severe symptoms. Excellent, thank you so much. I'm uh, just gonna maybe give it a few seconds if there is anyone else who would like to ask questions or make comments. Um, before we move to the next section. Yes, uh, Dr. Bora. Yeah, thank you, Brett, for the nice presentation. So I, I, I think we all know as modelers, like we try to, it's essentially models are sort of, you know, replica of the real world, and we have to make a lot of assumptions. And one thing that I just noticed in your, I think in uh, table 4.2, you have the key assumptions for the model. And the, uh, looking at the last uh, assumption, uh, it seems like your, uh, the assumption is that starting age doesn't impact trajectory of BMS or the BMS related benefit of the treatment. I, I, I don't know. So it seems like you are targeting your target population is 54 years old. And then this BMS can start like, you know, as early as maybe 49, 51. And my understanding is that it can start uh, slow and it would peak and it would come back, you know, come down. Now, when you think about that kind of trajectory, I, I don't know. It, I, to me, it seems like very, very limiting assumption. Uh, do you have any sort of, you know, do you, uh, would you like yeah. to comment on that? Yeah, and, and I think the important point here is that age, the term age versus stage is really key because one of the things that I went in assuming was that age was predictive of the stage. And that was incorrect when I, this was like seven months ago when I was thinking about this. And so we wanted to make sure that age was first of all, representative of the trials and make sure that that's consistent. And then also the stage of menopause that for the trial participants, the advantage of using the SWAN study, even though, even despite the limitations that Dr. Grady brought up, is we have the ability to change the stage based on the duration. And you can do that in the ICER analytics platform that uh, David spoke about earlier. And so there is the ability to change those, the curves that I showed in the, um, in the duration slide. You can change the slide or the, the duration. I think the point though, is that do you have the evidence for the quality of life differences for later versus earlier stages? That's what we ran into when, for example, running scenario analyses around those. It just seemed like it was really difficult to, to then show the treatment effect. All we really had was the baseline evidence, but the model, I specifically, we built the model so that you could do that when the evidence presents itself later, hopefully. It's a really, really good and very detailed question. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, excellent. Um, another testimony to the uh, well put together group, I would say, with different perspective and expertise that make these discussions very uh, stimulating. Okay, um, I don't see any other hands up. So I think uh, we should go ahead and move to the next uh, section, which uh, would be the uh, public.